The Great Escape is one of the most unique Six Flags parks. Located in Queensbury, New York, this theme park has a very interesting history and a much different feel than the other Six Flags parks. Great Escape is commonly labeled as the redheaded stepchild of the Six Flags chain, but is that a fair moniker? While Great Escape may not have the same thrill lineup as the chain's other parks, Great Escape is one of the best themed and most charming parks in the Six Flags chain. In this video, I will review the Great Escape and explain why this park is worth visiting. This park originally opened in 1954 as Storytown USA. This Mother Goose theme park was initially geared towards children with all sorts of houses and play areas for them to climb in. And many of these structures still remain to this day. Then in 1957, Storytown USA had a western themed area called Ghost Town that has a lot of similarities to the popular area at Knott's Berry Farm between the western themed facades and rustic color palette. Over the next two and a half decades, the park added more mechanical rides and continued to focus on the family demographic. In 1983, the park was rebranded as the Great Escape. The front half maintained the same charm. Ghost Town remained and Storytown USA became a themed area in the park. And thankfully, Six Flags has kept the overall feel of these areas intact. But from this point onwards, Great Escape started adding more thrill rides, specifically relocated thrill rides. One of their earliest thrill coasters was Steam and Demon, an Arrow Triple Looper relocated from Pontchar Train Beach. And the park's signature attraction to this day is Comet, a relocated wood coaster from Crystal Beach. This is something that has continued under Six Flags' ownership, as the three adult coasters added under their ownership have been relocations. In 1996, Premier Parks purchased The Great Escape. Then, Premier Parks purchased Six Flags in 1998. Yet, Great Escape is one of three theme parks in the chain that was never fully flagged and fully rebranded as a Six Flags park. You have the familiar season passes, meal plans, and advertising in the park, but you also have some key differences from your usual Six Flags park. One, Six Flags has maintained much of the charm in that front half of the park. That was one of the biggest fears of locals when Charles Wood sold the park. Some of the walkthrough structures towards the front do look a bit dated, but they ooze charm, and it's something you'd expect to find at a children's park, not a corporate-owned thrill park. It's a refreshing change of pace from the chain's other parks, and it gives it a more family-owned feel in some areas. Two. The park no longer has the usual character licenses you find at the other Six Flags parks. From 2005 through 2010, the park had Looney Tunes and DC characters. There was a Looney Tunes National Park Kids area and the familiar Flash Pass Skip the Line system. However, these two items were transformed into Timbertown and the Go Fast Pass system, respectively from 2011 onwards. One of the biggest criticisms with this park compared to the others in the Six Flags chain is its new additions. After Premier Parks purchased Grey Escape, it received coasters three straight years in the late 1990s, but it has been 16 years since the park last received a new coaster, and 18 years since it last received an adult coaster. That is the longest drought in the Six Flags chain, and long even by family park standards. However, the park's location is likely to blame. The Grey Escape's location is both a blessing and a curse. This park is located in Queensbury, New York, which is adjacent to the super touristy Lake George and Adirondack Mountain regions. This area is gorgeous, and the park's tallest rides offer stunning views of those mountains. While the park has a smaller resident base to draw on than other Six Flags parks due to its location, it receives a steady dose of tourist traffic annually. Tourists visit the park less frequently than nearby residents, so they're less likely to notice a stagnant ride lineup or get bored with the park's offerings. And the park also makes a good profit even with modest investments. A larger proportion of the Six Flags Park's patrons are comprised of families. This demographic spends more per visit on average than the teenage heavy crowds at the other parks in the Six Flags chain. The park also capitalized on this location and crowd by building the Six Flags Grey Escape Lodge and indoor water park across the street 
in 2006. This hotel feels similar to the Great Wolf Lodge between the wilderness-inspired aesthetic and family-friendly amenities. I've stayed at this hotel a few times and it's a really nice hotel. The indoor water park is a little small, but has a handful of decent slides and the location is hard to beat. It's a convenient walk to the Great Escape and a short drive from the region's other activities. Not only has this hotel been well received by guests, but it gave the Great Escape a new revenue stream that few Six Flags parks have. This hotel can stay open year round. If the amusement park itself wants to expand, there are two obstacles the Great Escape faces. One, staffing. Unlike most Six Flags parks that are just a hop, skip, and a jump from a large metro area, the Great Escape is roughly an hour north of Albany and 30 minutes north of Saratoga Springs. This makes it hard to find seasonal workers. Just look at the 2021 job fair that netted the Great Escape just nine workers. To combat this, Great Escape has some employee housing just across the street. But that limited staffing pool helps explain why this park has both shorter hours and a shorter season than the other Six Flags parks. The park is not offering holiday in the park at this time, and it usually closes by sunset most summer days. Two, town restrictions. When Storytown USA opened, it was a much smaller theme park with minimal traffic and limited mechanical rides. The Gray Escape has become a much larger attraction with rides approaching 200 feet or 61 meters in height, and the park now has longer hours. Residents have expressed concerns about noise and traffic. Noise is why the Alpine bobsled closes by 6 p.m. daily. And most recently, the park's new for 2021 Adirondack Outlaw attraction received extensive opposition, and Gray Escape had to change the ride's proposed location to satisfy a local height ordinance. But a bigger issue is that the park is on the hook for traffic improvements if attendance hits a certain threshold. Per an agreement with the town, if Great Escape causes a traffic increase of 500 cars per hour at the peak morning hour, the park will have to foot the bill for a new traffic light and ring road into the park. This project would have minimal benefit to the park, but incur a whopping price tag. I suspect Great Escape wants to stay below this threshold as long as possible, and if the park continues to be profitable at their current level, they don't have much incentive to change. The current parking lot entrance is located roughly a half mile down the road. Guests must then cross a bridge to reach the park. And if you visit on a busy day, you may be parked in a grassy meadow since the Six Flags Park has a much smaller parking lot than usual. If you don't have a season pass or membership, be prepared to pay roughly $20 to $25 to park on top of that daily admission. Increased attendance could also be problematic for the park itself. The entrance area is very small. There are not many turnstiles and it can get congested at park opening. And likewise at park closing, it gets very busy because the park exit is through a narrow gift shop. And many of the pathways towards the front of the park are super tight. They can become quite congested on busy days. The most notable examples are the compact international village just inside the park, the multiple bridges, and the pathway by pandemonium leading to the back half of the park. The park's signature rides also do not have the capacity you may expect for a large park like this. Almost every coaster only has one train. This causes lines to move at a snail's pace on busier days. One exception is the Comet, which is the only high capacity coaster in the park. That's a welcome sight because it's easily the park's star attraction. Despite its popularity, Comet usually isn't more than a 15 minute wait most days. The other coaster that can run multiple cars is the Alpine Bobsled, which has arguably the worst capacity of any ride in the park. This coaster can only seat 6 riders per car now, and it averages a dispatch every 2 minutes. This means the ride has an hour wait most days, and that assumes the ride is even open. This intimate bobsled is plagued with downtime. It usually opens one hour late most days, closes by 6 p.m. daily due to those aforementioned noise issues, has mechanical issues, and it cannot run if the track is wet. Obviously, that means the ride cannot run in the rain, 
but it sometimes can take a few days for the trough to fully drain after a storm. If the alpine bobsled is a priority for you, it's best to plan a visit after several consecutive days without precipitation. And unfortunately, it's not on the Go Fast Pass system either, although it is included on membership Skip the Line passes. It's also worth knowing the park typically lists this ride as closed by default on the app, even if it is operating. That's how much downtime the Alpine bobsled has, although it did seem to run more reliably in 2021. There are four other rides that can have particularly bad queue lines. You have the two water rides and the Raging River Rapids ride, and the Desperado Plunge Log Flume. The latter tends to have a worse weight due to how few logs are on the course. You want to hit these too early, especially if it's a hotter day. Then there's Blizzard, the cool indoor scrambler. This is a classic for great escape, and while the line may not appear to be physically long, this indoor scrambler is a super slow loader. The other ride with lengthy weights is the newly opened Adirondack Outlaw, due to how it only seats 16 riders per cycle and takes a very long time to load. If you want to avoid the crowds, my recommendation is to start with Adirondack Outlaw and Desperado Plunge over in Ghost Town. Then make sure you're back at Alpine Bobsled for its opening one hour after the park. If you have time in between the rides in Ghost Town and getting to Alpine Bobsled, you can hit some of the coasters or Blizzard on the way. Once you get off Alpine Bobsled, you are right by Raging River's entrance and it should not have a line yet. If you want to do the water park, you should be able to hit the popular slides at this point before the masses arrive. And then you can save the higher capacity and or less popular rides in the dry park for the mid to late afternoon. As I hinted, Great Escape does not have the usual coaster lineup you'd expect from a Six Flags park. There are just six roller coasters in total. Comet is a good wooden roller coaster. This PTC double out and back ride is a sea of airtime hills. While the ride is not running as fast as it used to, it's still pretty smooth and has some decent airtime moments on roughly half the hills. Then the ride also has zero banking, so you also get some surprise laterals on the turnarounds and kinked bunny hills. I have a separate review going into more detail, but Comet is the main reason coaster enthusiasts should have this park on their radar. Alpine Bobsled is the best steel coaster in the park without a doubt. I touched on how difficult this ride is to get on, and that's a shame because it is fun. And while it is cool sliding up the walls, the real thrill comes when you feel the bobsled momentarily jump off the track. It's a sensation you cannot get on any other coaster. This bobsled coaster does have pacing problems, and it is repetitive, but the novel riding position makes it fun for all ages. I have a separate review going into more detail, but may the odds ever be in your favor of riding this problematic coaster. Canyon Blaster is a poor arrow mine train. This ride barely does anything. The first half just passes some static figures, and then the second half is just one giant helix that leads into a brake run. The poor layout is one thing, but the fact this ride is bumpy too makes it one of the worst coasters out there, in my opinion. I have a separate review going into more detail, but it's my least favorite adult coaster at the park. Although, Steam and Demon gives Canyon Blaster a run for its money. This arrow loop and corkscrew model looks great at the front of the park, but it's very bumpy. Everything after the vertical loop is riddled with shuffling and head banging. I do like the pop of airtime in the first drop and the positive G's in the vertical loop, but I dread everything that follows. The best looping coaster at this park is actually Flashback, the Vacoma Boomerang. This is one of the newer and smoother boomerangs out there, which makes it easier to appreciate the intense forwards and backwards layout. The final coaster is Frankie's Mine Train, which is a well-themed kiddie coaster in Timbertown. Kids love this ride, and if you're a coaster enthusiast wondering, yes, adults can ride without a child. The park also has the old show building for Nightmare still standing in Ghost Town, but the coaster is long gone. This Schwarzkopf Jetstar was, pun intended, a nightmare to ride. Due to braking issues, it could only seat a maximum of two riders per car, and that putrid capacity was why it was ultimately removed. Now the building is just used for storage. Great Escape no longer has any traditional dark rides, 
they used to have the classic tornado where Canyon Blaster now stands. But the park does have Blizzard, the aforementioned indoor scrambler. This ride originally opened in 1971 as Chipper's Magical Mystery Tour, but Six Flags moved the ride outdoors for the 2005 season. And then they decided to move the ride back indoors for the 2013 season due to popular demand and renamed it Blizzard. This is one of the fastest scramblers out there, and when paired with the booming pop music and flashing lights, it becomes a memorable experience. I think it's one of the park's best rides, and it's a real treat if you've never experienced an indoor scrambler. The park also has an outdoor walkthrough, sort of reminiscent of a dark ride in Alice in Wonderland. The attraction does look dated, but it's a scenic retelling of the classic story with some charming sets. It has a similar aesthetic to the storybook section at the front of the park. There also used to be a similar walkthrough known as Jungle Land, with several swinging bridges and animal animatronics. The entrance was at the very back of Timbertown, but it has been closed unfortunately. Great Escape has a strong flat ride collection. This is where most of the investment on the dry side has gone over the past decade. I already mentioned Blizzard, but there are several other spinning rides scattered throughout the park. One of the most notable is a rare Hoos Condor. It not only offers some fun forces, but has a great location atop the hill in Ghost Town. For the high thrill rides, you have some great options as well. Adirondack Outlaw is a great funtime vomitron. This towering attraction offers incredible views and high speeds, while also inverting riders high above the ground. While the Funtime version may not be as intense as some of the other boosters or skyscrapers out there from other manufacturers, this one runs a very long cycle and has a strong location to compensate. I have a separate review going into more detail on this ride, but it may be the next big attraction that Six Flags installs across their parks. Sasquatch is an SNS drop tower that offers similarly great views. This one has a space shot side that blasts you up and a turbo drop side that shoots you down. It's not the most forceful drop tower out there, but it offers a little bit of airtime at least with those visuals. Lastly, you have the Extreme Supernova. This Amperla Frisbee has a long cycle and several pops of airtime, but it has been closed in most of my visits as of late. Hopefully it reopens in the future because it is a lot of fun. For young kids, you have almost a dozen attractions in Timbertown plus another small kitty section near the water park. Great Escape also has two water rides, plus a water park. Raging River is an interesting rapids ride. I love the wooded setting, and there are a decent number of okay rapids, but the water smells a bit foul, and some of the water features are comically lazy. Two examples are a pipe with a bunch of holes popped in it, and another is a PVC pipe that just dumps water at a constant stream into the raft. Most other parks would theme these elements. Desperado Plunge is an old arrow log flume that circles around the old Nightmare Show building, and the park's graveyard. This one has a small show scene before the final drop, which is honestly the highlight because that final drop is quite small and not very thrilling. The recently renamed Hurricane Harbor Water Park is pretty good. It's included with admission and has a wide range of slides. What's interesting with this water park is that it splits Comet from the rest of the dry park. The way you have to walk through the water park to get to some of the dry rides is reminiscent of Kentucky Kingdom. Half the water park runs alongside Comet. That's where you'll find the newer slides, including the Alpine Freefalls Trapdoor Slide. This is the park's most thrilling water slide. It's short, but has a steep plunge that will take your breath away. The other half has the tube slides. The older ones are located on a hill. Most of them are slow and meandering, but Banshee Plunge is an exception. This slide features a fast and thrilling double down that can give a little bit of air time. The newer tube slides are larger pro slide ones, such as the Tornado Funnel Slide and Mega Wedgie Bowl Slide. Then there are a series of pools lazy rivers and water play structures for the younger guests. And to be honest, I almost enjoy the water park more than the dry park. There really is a strong collection of slides there. Great Escape has your typical Six Flags food. This one sometimes has a decent chunk of its food stands closed due to staffing, 
but those that are open have the familiar overpriced burgers, chicken tenders, pizza, and snacks. If you don't have a meal plan, I would advise eating outside the park for better quality and value. And one place I do want to highlight is Martha's Dandy Cream. This soft serve ice cream shop is literally located right across the street from Great Escape. And while I personally don't like ice cream, my fiance says it's some of the best ice cream in the world and the portions are unbelievably large. It would also be a shame if I didn't spend a section of this review highlighting just how much the Lake George region has to offer. The region has all the outdoorsy activities you could ever want from hiking to water skiing to parasailing. It also has my favorite mini golf courses. Around the world and around the US mini golf are two elaborately well themed courses with unique obstacles inspired by famous landmarks and animals. So do I recommend The Great Escape? If you're a fan of amusement parks and find yourself in the upstate New York or Lake George region, absolutely. It is the best theme park in the area and has a diverse lineup with something for everyone. I think Great Escape shines in particular for younger guests because of the family-friendly ride lineup and abundance of walkthrough attractions. I think there are better parks in New England, but Grey Escape is still a decent park. It has a good amount of charm, some interesting non-coasters, and Comet is a fun historic wood coaster. If you're a coaster enthusiast planning a northeast trip, I'd say Grey Escape is worth considering after you've hit all the other major ones because it doesn't have a standout coaster anymore, nor a deep coaster lineup. So those are my thoughts on the Great Escape the Six Flags Park in Queensbury, New York. What are your thoughts on arguably the chain's most unique park? Do you enjoy what this park has to offer? I would love to hear what you think about The Great Escape down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.